All right, I am continuing with the video on parametric equations. And the next thing we're going to talk about is slope, slope of the tangent line. Slope of the tangent line can give us a sense of the direction in which a particle is moving if we're thinking of this in terms of motion. So I've already started this picture. Slope of the tangent line, as before, oh, I have a little typo here, tangent. We know that slope of the tangent line is the limit of slope of the secant line. So let's imagine we have two points on this parametric curve. And we're thinking, here's where the particle is at some time. And then we wait delta t later. We change the time, and here's where it is. So we have x and y for time t. And we have x and y for time t plus delta t. So let's figure out the slope of the secant line. The slope of the secant line would just be the change in y over the change in x. And the change in y would be the y-coordinate where we end minus the y-coordinate where we began. Same with the change in x, the x-coordinate where we ended minus the x-coordinate where we began. Slope of the tangent line would be the limit of this expression as the change in time approaches zero. And now I'm going to do something slick. I'm going to divide top and bottom by delta t. fix this delta, look a little bit like an A. Now I'm going to use the property that assuming all these limits exist, the limit of a fraction is the same as a fraction of limits. So this is actually the same as the limit of this whole thing on the top. Over the limit of this whole thing on the bottom. And hopefully this will look familiar. What we have here is the limit definition of the derivative, just y as a function of time. And in the bottom, it's the same thing, but with x. Right, so this is really nice to figure out the slope of the tangent line. We just have y prime of t over x prime of t. Right? If you write it using the differentials, it's basically as though these dt's cancel each other out. Yeah, I get dy over dx. Just take this derivative with a y, this derivative with an x, and the t's cancel. Right? Maybe that's being a little bit cheating, but it works out in terms of how the formula works. It's just derivative of y divided by derivative of x. Right, so our slope formula here, dy over dx, is just the rate of change for y as a function of time over the rate of change of x as a function of time. It's really elegant and super easy to remember. So let's look at an example. So for that cycloid example, let's copy those parametric equations we had. We're going to do a few things. Well, first, we'll figure out the slope of the tangent line um, when we're at theta equals one radian. So basically after rotating through one radian, what is the slope of the tangent line? We 
can look at this on the graph. When we're at one radian, we're right here, and we want to know how steep is that graph. How steep is that red graph at that point? Um, somehow I've changed my aspect ratio here, um, so it's a little hard to tell, but we're expecting some medium big positive number. What else do we want to answer? Part two, where would the tangent line have a slope of one? Again, looking at this graph, we can probably imagine there's some place along the way where the steepness of that red graph is one. Seems to transition somewhere, right, from steeper than one to less than one. And we also want to figure out where is there a horizontal tangent line and where is there a vertical tangent line. So let's just write our derivatives down here. This is 1 minus cosine theta. This is sine theta. So for 1, the slope of the tangent line at theta equals 1, that's just y prime of 1 over x prime of 1. So that's sine of 1 over 1 minus cosine 1. And this is 1 radian. We don't have this memorized. I will just have my calculator do this. So sine of 1 divided by 1 minus cosine of 1. And this is approximately 1.830. That seems plausible that we have a slope there that is somewhere in the neighborhood of 2. Again, I've messed up. Here we go. All right, slope of a tangent there about 1.8. That's believable to me. For number two, we want to know where is the tangent line, where does the tangent line have a slope of one? So generally speaking, the slope of the tangent line will be the derivative of y over the derivative of x. And we want that to be equal to one. So that would imply that sine of theta equals 1 minus cosine theta, which actually means sine of theta plus cosine theta is equal to 1. And just from intuition, you might realize, oh, that would happen if sine is 1 and cosine is 0, or vice versa. Um, although if cosine is 1, we're dividing by 0. So we might just notice this happens when sine is 1 and cosine is 0. We just have 1 over 1 here, and the first place that would happen is at pi over 2. So if we go to pi over 2, about 1.5, 1 1.6, that seems to be where the slope of the tangent line is 1. Okay, for number three, we want to know where would there be a horizontal tangent. Horizontal tangent would mean that this slope of the tangent line, same as before, is equal to zero, which implies the numerator is equal to zero, which would happen at, say, theta equals pi. Let's take a look. If we go to approximately 3.1, right around there, yeah, that's where our tangent line is going to be horizontal. When we've gone exactly halfway around, the motion is horizontal. That seems very intuitive. 
And then where will there be a vertical tangent? That will happen where this derivative is undefined, which presumably means our denominator is zero, which means cosine is equal to one. And that would happen, for example, at theta equals two pi. And look here, two pi is where this happens. And it's hard to tell for sure, but basically we're getting a cusp there. If you were to zoom in, it's getting infinitely steep. It actually has a vertical tangent. If we zoom out, it looks like a corner but we actually have a vertical tangent there. Right, so weird things happen at multiples of pi, that seems believable. Okay, right, so again, this is our slope formula. All of the kinds of things you can do with slope from last year, you can do the same thing. Now, concavity is trickier. Here is the problem, let's do this, this is a warning. First derivative with parametric feels so intuitive. Second derivative is not. Right. This is true. dy over dx, which measures the slope of the tangent line, is just the first derivative of y over the first derivative of x. A lot of people want the second derivative to just be second derivative divided by second derivative, but that is not true. For second derivative to find concavity, it's much more complicated, and we really need to emphasize what are we actually computing here. So I will remind you, d squared y over dx squared, our second derivative under the traditional y and x system, which measures the concavity, it means the derivative of the first derivative with respect to x. So here's sort of the trick. Suppose I want to take the derivative of something with respect to x. If we are thinking in terms of parametric equations, right? pretend this is y. How do I find dy over dx? Well, it's the derivative of y with time as the variable over the derivative of x with time as the variable. We might write it like this. This is exactly what we saw before, but I'm calling it f instead of x. Me is instead of y. Right? This is just a general pattern regardless of what something is called. Now, what if the function f actually is this first derivative? Then if we follow this pattern we just saw, right? I want to know what's the derivative of that first derivative. Well, just everywhere we see an f, we're going to plug in dy over dx. So it's the derivative with respect to time of the first derivative divided by the derivative with respect to time of x. So we have to find this first derivative first, get it in terms of t, then take its derivative. This is much more complicated. Let's try this with an example. So suppose we have the ellipse parameterized with x equals cosine t and y equals sine t. This is basically like the unit circle only twice as tall. It will be an ellipse like so. And there is a point somewhere along here where t equals pi over 4. And suppose I want to know the concavity certainly looks like it would be concave down there. Let's see if we can measure that. So here's what we need to do. First, we need to find dy dx. So that would be y prime of t over x prime of t. That's 2 cosine t over negative sine t. So negative I'll write this as negative 2 cosine t over sine t. That measures the slope at any given point. Now, if we want this second derivative that measures concavity, what we need to do is we need to say that's the derivative of the first derivative.
over the derivative of x, where both of these outer derivatives have time as the variable. So here, we're going to need quotient rule. If you did this as cotangent, it's faster. Um, but by quotient rule, I have derivative of the top, which would be 2 sine t times the bottom, which is sine t, minus the top, which is negative 2 cosine t, times the derivative of the bottom, which is cosine t, all over the bottom squared. And then dx dt remains negative sine t. Let's simplify this first. I have 2 sine squared t plus, those negatives cancel, 2 cosine squared t over, we actually have negative sine cubed t. And that numerator is just 2. I'm going to write it like this. So it simplifies reasonably well. So at t equals pi over 4, this second derivative that, that is measuring concavity would be negative 2 over sine of pi over 4 cubed. So that's negative 2 over, if we cube root 2, we get 2 root 2. If we cube 2, we get 8. Let's see how well we can simplify this. Hopefully I'm not doing something dumb. Then we get negative 4 root 2. It's definitely negative. That number seems as plausible as anything else. Right? This is not fun. But if you ever need to address concavity in a parametric situation, you have to screech to a halt and remember it is not second derivative divided by second derivative. You have to find the first derivative and then take its derivative parametrically. All right, and one last thing, area. There's no special formula here, but under certain circumstances, we might have a curve where, you know, it does some weird things, but perhaps at least locally we can talk about the area under the curve and above the x-axis like we did in Calc AB. Maybe we can't do that when it's circling back on itself, but at least locally, sometimes y, functions, y behaves like a function of x. So under those circumstances, we find the area just by doing the integral between whatever reasonable bounds we have of y dx. And the trick is just to convert these into things that have t in them. So try doing that for the ellipse in the previous problem. And we want to, sorry, let's read the problem. For the ellipse in the previous problem, let's find the integral giving the area of the interior portion in quadrant 1. And you do want to be careful with those endpoints. So suppose we're trying to find that area, thinking of it in terms of parametric equations. What would that look like? Hit pause and try it. All right. So here is what's a little bit tricky about this. We do integrals from left to right when we're thinking of this in terms of area. So here, the left bound is at t equals pi over 2, and the right bound is at t equals 0. We need to honor that. We're moving from left to right, even if the parameter is moving backwards. So our area here would be the definite integral from pi over 2 to 0, because that's really the direction from left to right, of 
of y dx. You can write t equals here to remind you what this really means. y was 2 sine t. x was cosine t, which means dx dt is negative sine t, which means dx is negative sine t dt. So this is the definite integral from pi over 2 to 0. I forgot my dx there. Of 2 sine t times negative sine t dt. Now I'm going to do two, three things at once. Well, two things at once. Swapping those limits of integration negates the answer, which will cancel that negative. And then we'll notice that we have 2 times sine times sine, so I'll write sine squared. Now, this particular integral, there's actually a really slick way to do this. So this is just one of these fun little facts. Even if you don't know the integral of sine squared, so let's think about the graph of sine, just from 0 to pi over 2. Graph of sine is like so. Graph of sine squared is similar, but a little bit lower. Uh, sorry. Um, yes, it's a little bit lower. So here, sorry, I'm, I'm not being very clear here. This is the graph of sine theta. And then here's 1, here's pi over 2. Cosine theta is the same shape, but backwards. Now, if we imagined sine squared, let's just do it like so. There's sine squared. I'm not going to worry about exactly what it looks like. The graph of cosine squared would still be the same graph, but backwards. So what that means is the definite integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine squared theta, d theta, which represents the area underneath this green curve. That should be the same as the area under this green curve. Even though we don't know what that number is, we know those areas should be the same. So now, what if I think about the integral of sine squared plus cosine squared? On the one hand, that's the integral of 1, which will just be pi over 2. On the other hand, this would be the integral of sine squared over that interval plus the integral of cosine squared over that interval. But we know those are the same, so it's actually two copies of this integral of sine squared. So what that means is that integral of sine squared from 0 to pi over 2 must be half of pi over 2 or pi over 4. And so without actually doing any real calculus here, we're just using a trig identity and symmetries in the graph. If we're going from very specifically 0 to pi over 2, the integral of sine squared or cosine squared is exactly pi over 4. So going back here, we have 2 times that. So this is exactly pi over 2. And hopefully that makes sense. What we have here is the unit circle, but twice as tall. The unit circle, the unit circle is like so. 
that has an area of pi. We've made it twice as tall, so it has twice as much area. This entire ellipse has an area of 2 pi, and this is one quarter of it. So this absolutely makes sense as what that area should be. All right, we've finally gotten to the end there. This is probably about an hour or so combined with two videos. Um, but it's all here in case you need to review.